Philip Anthony Albertelli. Welcome to the inaugural episode of The Week in Doubt, a podcast for atheists, agnostics, and whoever. And I really want to emphasize the whoever, because I don't want this podcast to seem exclusive, or at least not too exclusive. I'd like it to be not just for fellow non-believers, but for people of a philosophical bent in general, the intellectually curious, etc., As you could probably surmise from the title, my basic goal is to cover topical issues that have to do with religion, atheism, and then basically elaborate with my own philosophical take on things. Before I move on to any of the aforementioned topical issues, I should probably give a brief introduction to my own religious views or lack thereof and how they developed. I'm always a little hesitant to label my beliefs. On the one hand, I think maybe I just have a healthy aversion to labels because I know they can be constricting. And on the other hand, I think it's because of that strange overlap between the terms atheist and agnostic. I believe it was T.H. Huxley, a man who was known as Darwin's bulldog due to his strong stance in defense of the idea of natural selection, who coined the term agnostic. I'm a fan of Penn Jillette, and I remember listening to him recently, and he had described the word agnostic as a kind of weasel word, meaning a nicer, softer, more palatable way of saying atheist. I think most of us tend to think of agnostic as referring to someone who claims to not be sure whether or not there's a god, and an atheist is someone who claims that there is no god. But I don't think it's that clear cut. In fact, I'm trying to think of the staunchest atheists out there. Maybe people like the new atheists, uh, people who I admire, like the late Christopher Hitchens, um, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris. And um, I think all of them have more sense than to actually claim that they know 100% that there is no God. I think it's more the case, and I'll include myself here, that an atheist is someone not who claims to know 100% that there isn't a god, but who tends to think that religions are man-made belief systems and they doubt the existence of God because the empirical evidence just doesn't seem to be there and the supernatural claims of, of various world religions don't really seem to pass muster and I think that's where the overlap lies Um, neither an atheist nor an agnostic would claim to know for certain whether there was or wasn't a god we may tend to think of an agnostic as someone who's more open-minded than um, that stereotype many people have of the smug um, stubborn atheist but in reality there is that overlap so i suppose i kind of fit both definitions on the one hand i don't claim to know for certain whether there is or isn't a god but on the other hand i certainly doubt his her or its existence ergo i guess i'd be happy being labeled, or at least relatively comfortable being labeled, either an atheist or an agnostic. But I guess if I was to choose a label for myself, I would simply refer to myself as a non-believer. It's uh, pretty much an accurate description, and it doesn't carry any of the connotations that you belong to some kind of group or organization. Which I guess brings me to my first topic. I know I'm a little behind the times with this one, but I'll ask that you forgive me since it's taken a while to get this project started. I was watching Bill Maher, um, real time with Bill Maher on HBO, as I am wont to do. And this is probably about three weeks ago now. Um, He had Kennedy on. I remember um, growing up watching her... uh, now well into my 30s. Um, She was a VJ on MTV back in the day, and now I believe she's a radio host, and she's pretty well known for her libertarian views. And as much as I like her, she said something um, during the show that just totally got under my skin, and it's probably a pet peeve for a lot of people who identify as atheists or non-believers 
the subject of religion had come up, as it often does on Bill's show, and she had replied to something Bill had said by saying, atheism is a religion too. I think my jaw dropped a little, but I was thankful that at least um, Bill had the presence of mind to call her comment shallow. Shallow might seem a little harsh, but I actually think it's pretty appropriate because I think her comment shows a fundamental misunderstanding of atheism. And it kind of goes back to what I was just discussing when I was talking about the overlap between atheism and agnosticism. There's this kind of misconception that the atheist believes 100% that there is no God and therefore um, they're a person in a f of faith in a sense because it takes faith to believe 100% that something doesn't exist. And I actually used to hold a um, similar view too back in my earlier more idealistic days. I used to kind of, even though I had an aversion to labels, I used to kind of pride myself on um, being merely agnostic and at least keeping the door open for the possibility that there might be something more. And so I used to kind of proudly say too that I thought atheism was a religion and I was wisely, you know, in the, in the middle in between the fundamental religious person and the uh, kind of bleak, stubborn atheist. And of course, as I got older and um, began to read the works of atheist authors more and, and whatnot, I came to realize just what I talked about earlier, there is that overlap where even the staunchest of atheists, if they're sensible, doesn't claim to know 100%. Um, what the ultimate truth of the universe is, whether there is or isn't some sort of higher power out there. Um, so that just drives me crazy when people fall back on that old saw that atheism is a religion too. And who knows, maybe it got under Bill's skin a little too, because I think it was the next week where he kind of uh, referred to it um, during his new rules segment and he actually had a pretty funny remark where I'm, I'm paraphrasing where he said that saying that atheism was a religion was like saying abstinence was a sexual position and as funny as it is I think it's also pretty accurate because atheism is pretty much the absence of religion not a religion in and of itself I remember that I mentioned in passing that I would talk about the development of my beliefs a little. And uh, as you could probably guess from my Italian surname, I was raised Catholic. Uh, we were fairly observant. I think like a lot of families, it started out church every Sunday. Then it kind of devolved to church just on the holidays and then um, pretty much church not at all but i did go to sunday school ccd um, first communion confirmation that sort of thing i think even at an early age i was pretty intellectually curious in regards to life's big questions and i think like all children or most children i had that moment that kind of loss of innocence that moment when you're confronted that with the fact that no virginia there isn't a santa claus or easter bunny or etc i remember kind of working from there and thinking well adults have a similar way of talking about god and jesus as they do when talking about those assorted mythical holiday figures Somewhere in my youth, I developed a avid interest in mythology, and that kind of blossomed into an interest in world history, a world religion. And I think once you start really studying those things, you begin to see the 
parallels between the belief system you've been indoctrinated into in those dead ones we call mythologies or the study of world history or a world religion can show you how belief systems evolve out of other belief systems um you begin to notice things like the contradictions um within religious texts for instance, if we look at the Old Testament, um, we have things like doublets, which are more than one account of the same story, uh, especially in the book of Genesis, um, with little differences in details, uh, the amount of animals brought aboard the ark, that sort of thing. If you move to the New Testament, you have things like the discrepancy between the synoptic gospels and the gospel of john where john has um, christ actually dying on a different day than in the synoptics most likely as a kind of literary device so that um christ could be depicted in his account as the paschal lamb as an actual uh passover sacrifice and if um, you know your Mesopotamian mythology, you start to notice kind of weird parallels. Um, for instance, um, a lot of you probably have heard of the Epic of Gilgamesh and the flood story contained therein and how closely it parallels um, the Noah flood story in the Old Testament. And I should say, um, despite the fact that I'm a non-believer, and this will probably come up a lot in the uh, series, I absolutely love the holidays. And I think those of us who are raised Catholic or Christian in general, we just take, when we're young, we take the holidays for granted as, as if they've always been Christian holidays. Um, we just take them at face value. But as you study world history and the history of religion you learn the weird little uh very interesting facts um about how christian holidays were grafted on top of pre-existing pagan traditions or combined with them and we end up with um things like the birth of christ being celebrated on the 25th of december which had already been a celebration time for the uh, the god Mithra or Mithras, and um, there's the Norse pagan traditions uh, of dragging an evergreen in and burning Yule logs and things like that. The Catholic All Saints Day, All Hallows Eve, being grafted on top of um, the Celtic uh, New Year Samhain and henceforth becoming Halloween. I think all those little things just kept drawing my attention more and more to the possibility or fact that religions are man-made and that there isn't um, seemingly a heck of a lot of evidence to back up religion's supernatural claims. And I think I also noticed that a lot of people kind of employed that cafeteria Catholic approach where because of the um, progress, ever continuing progress of science, um, religion is forced to come to loggerheads with science and give way in some areas to reasonable people at least uh, to scientific fact. For instance, we know that evolution is a fact it's called the theory of evolu evolution but i think uh, most scientists would agree it's a fact we have the fossil record and um dna evidence um we can see genetically how species are related to other species some people would say all right yeah i, I admit um I, I think um the story of adam and eve is just a parable we know about human evolution so no one magically plopped down um two perfect uh human specimens a male and a female and yet they'll still believe in the resurrection um i think it was richard dawkins one time we made a pretty valid and somewhat disturbing point how the death and resurrection of Christ was 
in part at least, supposed to be to save man from original sin, uh, to redeem man from the fall in, um, in the garden. But if you believe that the tale of the garden is a parable, then that kind of knocks out the foundation of the purpose of the of the death and resurrection of Christ. And I think just things like that, um, just noticing the man-made nature of religion eroded uh, away over time at my faith. I should point out, um, I don't think it was ever the case that I wanted to be a non-believer. I think that's a common misconception uh, about atheists. I, I actually think becoming a non-believer, at least in my case, was a rather painful experience. It can be pretty harsh to feel that the existential carpet, so to speak, has been pulled out from under you to have to face the fact that um, the meaning of life, the whole supernatural cosmology that you've been taught um, may be completely man-made in a sense that you're on your own to try to figure out what it's all about and um, what's true and what isn't. I think I actually wanted to believe, was even desperate to believe, but my reason just led me elsewhere. Um, for a while, I found solace in Eastern religion. Um, since I had lost faith in the idea of a personal God, of a uh, sentient creator, there was some comfort in um, that Eastern concept of God, where not really the personal God, but that totality of the universe, that oneness of all being. And I think it might have been Pope uh, John Paul once who described Buddhism as a kind of, um, maybe a, a, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, I might be completely wrong, but a, a romanticized atheism. Uh, I believe he did call it a kind of atheism. And I think that's true in a way. I think I almost looked at Eastern um, philosophy and religion as kind of training wheels for atheism or agnosticism because there is that big difference between Western and Eastern spirituality where in the West we have that desire to believe that our self is eternal and that there is this patriarchal um, personal creator where in the East, especially in Buddhism, um, the focus has moved away from the self. And in fact, in Buddhism, we have the term nirvana, meaning uh, something along the lines of the extinguishing of the flame or the extinguishing of the self, where reincarnation even is a kind of punishment and the ultimate goal is to attain that selfless oneness and break that cycle of um, birth and death then even um, that after a while seemed kind of romanticized to me and even though I still love that concept of cosmic oneness what does it really mean empirically and uh, I think luckily the human psyche like the human body is relatively resilient and I've actually reached a point in my life where the idea that I may not be eternal, the idea that there may not be a creator out there doesn't seem so scary or painful anymore. And um, but I don't want to drone on too long because I want to do a whole episode at one point on how even being a non-believer, you can still live a very rich and fulfilling life and even experience but for lack of a better word, you may, might consider spiritual experiences, um, the transcendent, the numinous, as Christopher Hitchens used to like to call it. I wanted to quickly cover um, a couple other recent stories. There's one um, that you may already have heard of, uh, of Miley Cyrus actually quoting Lawrence Krauss as a uh, surreal as that seems, she had tweeted out one of his quotes, and I'm paraphrasing yet again, the basic gist was he was talking about how we're basically all made of stardust, and it was stars rather than Jesus that died so we could live. Um, I actually thought 
I can understand why people of faith would be offended by actually thought it was pretty cool that um, a young person in the public eye seemed to, at least in passing, take an interest in science and uh, take a moment to uh, tweet something that heady. And I think she may even have gotten death threats, which doesn't seem very Christian. So, um, yeah, people should probably not do that. <laughs> and uh, there's one other story you may have heard of where Kirk Cameron, I actually saw this, he was on um, Piers Morgan Tonight, and Piers Morgan had asked him about his beliefs on homosexuality, and he basically said that it was unnatural and it was a danger to the um, foundations of civilization, etc. And that brought to mind this concept that I have. Um, I'm sure other thinkers have probably long beaten me to it, but in my own head, I draw this kind of dichotomy between um, what I consider a kind of universal human morality and then kind of religious or dogmatic morality. I think universal morality, whether or not it's truly universal, I don't know, but I hope so. Universal morality to me would be most of us would agree that rape, murder, theft, breaking into a, um, a person's home, um, child abuse, uh, these things are all wrong because they violate our fellow human beings. And hopefully we understand in our core, whether uh, we're religious or not, that those things are bad. And then I um, think of religious morality as those weird <laughs> prohibitions, things that we're not violating another person but still are forbidden to do because of kind of obscure religious reasons like um, having to eat fish on certain Fridays or not being able to pick up sticks on Saturdays or, um, you know, prohibitions about uh, what gender you have to lie with. Uh, being a straight guy, I feel like I don't have much of a dog in this fight other than I think it's wrong for other people to tell consenting adults um, what gender uh, of person they uh, can or cannot lie with. And I really think um, a kind of homophobia on a religious basis is a good example of that kind of strange religious dogmatic morality. Um, where no one's really being hurt by it. It's between consenting adults, but because there's a few passages um, about it in your particular religious text, um, you believe that it's a horrible sin. And I think it was Cenk Uger um, on the Young Turks, I'm a big fan of the Young Turks, who had actually brought up a good point that shellfish is also... Um, prohibited in the Bible, yet people seem to get far more worked up about um, things of a sexual nature. Um, I, don't know, I guess people just get more worked up about sex than they do about crustaceans and bivalves. So, food for thought. And I think that's it for the inaugural episode. So, thank you for listening, and hopefully I'll be back soon.